Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on the show, I get to introduce you to Karina Machado. Karina is a journalist with 25 years experience. She began her career in journalism as editorial assistant at Time Magazine in 1994 and is a former senior editor at Who Magazine. Karina was born in Uruguay and was two years old when her family moved to Australia, where she grew up hearing stories of her mom's psychic gift, igniting a lifelong curiosity about Marvel, mysteries, and the unseen world. Always passionate about books and writing, Karina is the author of the following four books, Spirit Sisters, Where Spirits Dwell, Love Never Dies, and Awaken, The Search is Over. You can visit her website at karinamachado.com. Joining us from Sydney, Australia, I'd like to give our guest, Karina Machado, a warm welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Welcome, Karina. Oh, Sandra, thank you. It's such a delight to be here with you. I'm so honored and excited. Yes, and you came highly me- recommended by our mutual <laughs> friend, Karen Swain. So a shout out to Karen for the introduction. Oh, thank- <laughs> yes, thank you, Karen. She is an amazing lady. I'm so lucky to know her as well. I feel the same way. And any recommendation from her is top on my list. So you're there. And I watched some of the episode of you with her being on her show. She's got a great yes. Uh, great show as well. So enough of me talking. Let's hear about you. Where does your story begin? You... Oh, goodness. How mm-hmm. far back can we go? I think go it all the way back. Begins... <laughs> okay. I think it actually begins, as most of our stories do, in childhood. I was, um, as you said, I was born in Uruguay, which is a um, little country at the bottom of South America, right. which is the, the continent that birthed, you know, the literary genre of magic realism. So I think a bit of, you know, uh, magic realism and excitement about mystery and, and marvels was in my DNA. And um, I, I was passionate about words, I think, from the minute I came out of the womb. And um, at, when we moved to Australia when I was two years old, it really wasn't long after that. I mean, I might have just been a little bit older that I began reading and I began listening to my mother's stories. And she shared uh, a few experiences uh, about premonitions where she'd sensed the imminent deaths of loved ones. Wow. And, and I was so small, but something in me lit up when I heard that. And it was like, I suddenly knew that there was something more to this world. If my mum could know when her uncle was about to pass away, minutes before he did, minutes before anybody knew that he was even sick, it's a story I tell in my first book, Spirit Sisters. And if my mum could know as a teenager that her little cousin who nobody knew was actually on death's door so sadly with leukaemia, if my mum could know minutes before, sorry, hours before that that was about to happen and get herself to her cousin's bedside in time for that, I just thought, what else is possible? What is happening? And so that that interest combined with my interest in, in reading and writing led to a career in exploring these things. But life took a detour, as it usually does in teenage years and early years of motherhood and marriage, and I did set all that aside um, but then came back to it with the publication of my first book, Spirit Sisters, in 2009. Wow, congratulations. And you had worked, you said, as edit- editorial assistant in Time magazine, senior yes. editor at Who magazine, so you took a mainstream I, I life, did, and as you many know, of us do. Yes, Sandra, and you know what, um, looking back, it was. I feel like there were no accidents and it was all putting me on the path. The The wonderful training that I had at um, Time and Who, which is the Australian sister publication of People magazine. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so I had wonderful uh, training in journalism, interviewing, fact-checking, and I really feel like that was, you know, God setting me up to to do this work where I would be interviewing people to share their experiences of their, their you know, their spiritual slash paranormal experiences, although I now don't believe that they are paranormal. I believe that they are normal. It's a part of being human to have 
to have these experiences, although we're not taught to welcome that or to accept it. Um, it although that is changing now. But I do feel like that wonderful training that I had at um, at Time and who really set me up to be in the best possible posi- position to author my books. Mm, it's interesting because I'm just looking at my own life and where there are things in my past that I thought at one point were the wrong choices. Everything set me up to be where I am right now. So anyone who's listening trying to figure mm. out maybe what your calling is or what your life purpose, you're, you're on it right now. And it, it could be, you could be developing for something else, but every That's, single yeah. thing plays a part now in, in who I am. Even I talking to you a few minutes before we started, uh, I just completed my second live event and conference called We Don't Die Orlando. And, Fantastic. And we did one in Boston as well. Shout out to all the folks that came. That was really wonderful. But had I not had my catering business to know how to serve and take care of there people, you go. It, it wouldn't have been the way it was. And that was really great. That's so true, Sandra. And every little thing goes together to make up that tapestry of who we are. And I, I was also reflecting on... Um, on one aspect of my life is that is a bit unusual is that I don't drive and I was I have my license but I I just I developed a little bit of a fear as a teenager and I just stopped and I don't think that that's obviously the right thing for everybody but looking back for me it it meant that all that time that I traveled on public transport and continue to do um, it meant that I had all this time to read to reflect to write and that was all building you know up right. to the books as well, they were all little building blocks towards um, creating, you know, this this future and this, uh, well, this present, I guess, this present where I am um, this writer who's been able to author my three nonfiction books and then co-author with my sister, Little Awaken, which um, which is a, a bit different. It's, it's removed from my other three books, but I can tell you more about that later. Um, but so, yeah, so even that, you know, even that where I had that opportunity to do so was, um, you know, contributed to this important path. Absolutely. And we should never make our past wrong. Sometimes yes. it would be nice to look ahead in the future and then be, give, be able to look back and say, oh, wow, I didn't think, you know, that was important. But some of the, some of the things we experience, even the tough times, really oh, help yeah. to make us who we are. I would almost say especially the tough times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so true. When you're in a difficult season, it, no doubt about it, it hurts. And um, you, it's very easy to, to feel like you're in the mire and you can't climb out, but you can and you will. And if you can, you know, look back and, and realize, and again, it's that, that tapestry. There's a wonderful writer called uh, Corey Tenboom. I don't know if you know her story. No. She lived. Um, in the Netherlands and she helped shelter Jewish people in World War II and she she then after that she escaped no, sorry she didn't escape she was in a concentration camp and she she was freed she was so fortunate and then dedicated her life to telling her story and she talked about life as a tapestry where on one side you see the beautiful picture and on the other side it really looks like a mess of strings and a very you know unpleasant almost thing to look at so scattered but it's just the perception, you know. Oh, so yeah. I've never heard it put that yeah. way before. Yeah, Corey, uh, Corey Tenboom, this lovely um, lady who passed away years ago now. But um, yeah, I, I read about it in her book, The Hiding Place. Mm. And what had you write your books? I mean, the, was there a tipping point of your investigations mm. or something that yes. happened that you said? I, I need to compile these stories and write. And so maybe you could tell us about that in your first book, which is Spirit Sisters, correct? Uh, yes, I'd love to tell you about that. There was a tipping point. Um, so I like to say that there are many paths that led to Spirit Sisters, and one of them was that lifelong fascination with the spirit world and this idea that it gave me hope and it lifted me. Um, I was never afraid of the idea that there was a life beyond the the, the physical. Um, so that was one. And then um, there was something else that happened when I was a young mum um, with my husband and our two little children living in a 1920s house in a suburb of Sydney that is close to the airport. 
called Rockdale, and strange things began to happen in the house. Now, my husband is a, um, a very down-to-earth bloke, as we say in Australia. He's mm-hmm. a tradesman. And he suddenly, it seemed like it came out of nowhere, but later we were able to piece it together, he suddenly began to see very vivid spirits in our home. So he saw three in particular. He saw a woman in a red nightgown. He saw a little boy who was so, so vivid in his personality. It really shone through. He made eye contact with him. And he also saw a little girl who was so flesh and blood-like that he mistook her for our own daughter. So I didn't see these these um, p- apparitions at the time, but certainly I experienced strange things that were happening in the house, such as the energy was heightened. There was a sense sort of that I that sense of the air before a thunderstorm, you know, this charged mm-hmm. feeling in the home. Some some unsettling things did happen like toys crashing over in the middle of the night and some, you know, some um, light bulbs exploding and that kind of thing. Um, and I thought, what is happening? And I um, had the opportunity to to have a, a home clearing and the lady came and she she was able to tell the spirits that they were in the wrong place and they should go to the light and then everything stopped. So then I thought, now what? What? How did this happen? Mm-hmm. How could this be? And uh, my husband told me that he'd begun not long before the the apparitions, he began to see the apparitions, he'd begun to meditate. And so I then began to research, well, what can awaken a psychic gift? And certainly meditation was one of the, um, is one of these things that if we do, for some people, it can ignite a, a dormant gift, a, a dormant mediumship, with, which it did in my husband's case. Now, um, he he decided he didn't want to pursue that so he shut that down and we've never ever had that experience again but I was intrigued and I um and I had always been intrigued in gathering experiences hearing people's stories and for me it it was something um certainly centered around women friends family so I thought what if I gather stories like this in a book and who else is experiencing quietly experiencing their house you know sharing their home with uh, visitors from the past. Let me see. So I began to look into it. And because I was uh, the books editor at Who, I um, I had contact with a lot of publishing companies in Australia. And there was, you know, there were lovely publicists who would take me out to lunch and coffee to share upcoming releases with me. And there was one publicist in particular who shared a wonderful ghost story with me. And I said, oh, I, I love your story. I've got this idea of, of gathering more stories like yours and putting them in a book and calling it Spirit Sisters. And she said, that's a great idea. Why don't I um, tell the publisher about you? And I went, oh, would you? Thank you. <laughs> and so to cut a long story short, it was, you know, ridiculously smooth, the process of, you know, meeting a publisher, getting a contract. She, My publisher immediately loved the book idea and, and – um, and it was just wonderful. And the stories poured in. They absolutely poured in. And this was really the days before, um, well, not so much before email. I did get stories from email back then when I was researching in 2008, but I also got lots of snail mail, as we call it, lots of letters in the post, people sharing their experiences with me, and I was inundated. And Spirit Sisters, in a sense, wrote itself. And in there, I was able to to put in my experiences with what had happened in my home, as well as the stories from my mother's past about Uruguay, and um, the stories about as you, you know in um, the early days of our immigration to Sydney. One of the things our family and friends would do would be to gather around um, and and have these moments where I guess you'd call them seances, mm-hmm. where they'd call the spirits, they wanted to speak to their loved ones from Uruguay. So that was really the only idea behind it. And I remember being little and peeking, you know, into this room where the adults were doing that and thinking how marvellous and strange that was. And so all of that got put into Spirit Sisters and to my amazement it was an instant success and I was so humbled and you know in such gratitude and it was totally unexpected and I think Sandra you know before we started recording you were telling me about how a similar thing happened with your podcast and you know I think when we have the intention just to to be open-hearted and share then life rewards us in a way that we couldn't really have even anticipated absolutely Absolutely. If you went out looking for, I'm going to write a book yeah. to make money 
to da 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 no. Totally. <laughs> no, exactly. And your second book, Where Spirits Dwell, that's the next? Yes, that's the next. And that one was commissioned quite quickly on the back of the success of Spirit Sisters. And um, it's full of stories. So where Spirit Sisters is a grab bag. I call it a grab bag mm-hmm. of experiences. So I was very much inspired by a show. You might remember this show. Um, it was an American show called That's Incredible. Do you remember yes. that? Yes. yes. Well, I loved, I loved That's Incredible when I was growing up. And I loved Great Mysteries of the World, which I think might have been called In Search of in mm-hmm. the US. And so Spirit Sisters was a real grab bag of stories of premonitions and apparitions and um, even, you know, people who are seeing their own doubles and all sorts of strange things. But where spirits dwell was more about hauntings. And I wanted to know what is going on in a house where people are experiencing a haunting. And my training as a journalist has always taught me to write the story through a person, not a a house, for instance. So my story was never about four walls. It was about the person in there Mm -hmm. and what they were experiencing as they were going through this quote-unquote haunting. And um, so it was more specific in its focus. And that was, yeah, that was where spirits dwell. And as with the Spirit Sisters, I included a chapter about being this idea of being haunted by love, you know, and this idea of our loved ones just constantly being with us. So that was a theme that was was very um, was big in my heart, and I knew that I wanted to come back to explore that specifically in a third book, which I did eventually in Love Never Dies. Well, let me just ask you about the ask- hauntings, because yes, yeah, there's a yeah. lot of controversy as to mm. what's happening in the spirit world Mm. let's put it that way but I believe that a lot of what may be called hauntings have to do with the individuals that say they're haunted so it's less about the house more about the people oh I I couldn't agree with you more I feel that there is an idea um, something to do with resonance you know Mm -hmm. this idea of like attracting like and if there is something unexplored in us unhealed perhaps and we we are one of those you know persons who has more of this gift manifesting in us than others then we may be in a situation where we'll experience this haunting you know and whether it's um how how negative or how f- fearful it is again may depend on whatever is going on in ourselves and in our lives i absolutely agree with you sandra mm. and then there's also i've heard things that people have been scared of being in a particular house but meanwhile there's a person in the spirit world that's trying to get attention. One case in point yes. is a, a 16 year old that was on drugs and the, you know, the cabinets start moving and people think it's possession. Mm. Well, there were drugs hidden in the cabinet. Somebody was trying to warn the parents that hmm. the son's going down the wrong course here, you know? And so, right. Yeah. It, it was very interesting. And I, it, it is. Yeah, more to life than meets the eye, for sure. More to us oh, than we know, goodness. for sure, <laughs> in this I, life yes. and beyond. Oh, yes. Oh, that's so- what drives me, that, that what you just said, and that's um, a favorite quote of mine by Shakespeare mm-hmm. in Hamlet. You know, there are more things in heaven and, and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy, and um, that is what's, what underpins all my work. That's great. And I'm even thinking our mind can make a hell out of heaven and a heaven out of hell. Yes. You know that one? Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. And I, I truly believe that too. Yes. Yeah, it's that whole glass half full, half empty. And I was also yeah. saying just before we got on that I I had a tough day today. Not Nothing too yeah. bad, but, you know, human. And it's so yes. easy to look at what's undone as opposed to looking at how much I have done and the gratitude factor. And I think oh, I, yeah. I knew that this conversation with you would just be the one. So oh, <laughs> I'm every bit as so much lovely to know. <laughs> a listener as anyone who's listening right now. Oh. But how about Love Never Dies? Because and I'd also like to get your input on why you believe in the afterlife. I mean, I've done now 305 episodes hearing some really incredible stories. And I, oh, wow. I, I've gone from a a hope and a faith and then a belief in the afterlife to now mm. absolutely knowing what beyond a shadow of a doubt that our loved ones are around. We will see them again and love never does die. And, mm. it, you know, death is an illusion. 
our bodies go, but we don't. That's what I believe with all my heart and soul. But I just want to get your take on it mm. and talk about love as well. Yes. Well, I, you know, what you said, your summary of how your journey of belief has evolved, I, I mean, I, I echo that. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, as a little child, I became fascinated with this idea that there's more to life. And I'll tell you a little story about how the afterlife, the idea of the afterlife propped me up from such a young age. But um, I read, I was a little child of seven or eight, and I read in in a children's textbook that one day the sun would obliterate the earth and that this was a scientific fact and it was, you know, perhaps millions if not billions of years away, but it Mm -hmm. would transpire. That's what my book said. And, you know, children can be morbid. They can get fixated on death and it, it usually happens at around that time as well. And I was like that and I got very fearful. You know, I was thinking, I kept on trying to imagine this nothingness. You know, if the sun obliterates the earth, how I kept on trying to imagine this vacuum of nothing, this, this you know, vacuum of life. Right. And um, and really, it was only this idea that I'd had from from knowing, from hearing my mum's stories, um, and just understanding that, that there was more. This this innate knowing. It was really only that that pulled me out of that fearful state and showed me that no, there is there is hope, there is life, and there is life eternal. And that was that was my my first you know inkling. And as a small child, so I. I mean, I think that I've been building on that hope ever since, you know, and it was an exciting idea. Like this is the thing. It was never chilling to me, the afterlife. And even though I went on in my research as a journalist in my three books to hear some pretty spooky stories, Hmm. never, I was never shaken really in my, in my understanding that ultimately this is a joyful, positive idea that we go on, you know, and then going on to so so my books kind of reflect my journey um so there's spirit sisters with its exploration of all sorts of different manifestations of our contact with the spirit world or the afterlife and all the different ways that can manifest um through to where spirits dwell which looks specifically at hauntings and you know some positive and some very beautiful stories in there right through to the idea that love never dies so now I'm that is my focus in life. Like I, I believe that that love and um, eternity are one, you know. And you can, if you're somebody who believes in God, and I, I have a deep faith, and that I've come to that through this journey too. I sometimes sure. say that ghosts led me to God. <laughs> um, wow. Whatever you, whatever you call God, you know. Mm-hmm. I think that there, in, there's no way to actually sum up that um, that concept. That our language will always fail. Um, And I'm not someone who grew up with any sort of faith or church at all. So I've come to this all by myself. And to me, it's it's a beautiful idea of eternal love and, you know, eternal um, uh, hope. So, yeah, so I I loved working on Love Never Dies because it just cemented this idea of, um, of our loved ones always being around us. And, you know, when you speak to a mother who has lost her two children in a a horrific car accident along with her mother-in-law and you hear that it was, you know, that she was on the verge of suicide and it was only this this experience of seeing her little girl's spirits come to visit her on the very night that she had had resigned herself to to taking her own life so that she could join her family. Um, And it was only this idea of seeing her, her daughters in spirit that lifted her out of that place. When you you have that experience of speaking to someone like that, it's very powerful and life-changing. That story is in Spirit Sisters, my first book, and I've never, ever forgotten it. And I was very fortunate to be able to revisit my interview with this lovely lady, her name's Kath, um, for my upcoming podcast. Well, my podcast has been launched, but I haven't um, played that interview yet. But it was just so beautiful to speak with her 10 years on, and know that um, that she has never wavered in her faith that her girls continue and that life continues. So she actually saw the apparitions of the yes. girls. Yes. So um, what had happened was it was it's it's um, it's such a sad story. But her she was on a weekend away with her husband and the girls who were um, little primary school aged were left in the care of her mother-in-law and there was a a horrific car accident which took all three of them 
And she was, you know, she was just beside herself with grief, mm-hmm. devastated and, and begging her husband in the aftermath to, to go with her to, you know, back to, to the other side to leave this world. And, um, and it was only this experience that she saw the girls, she actually saw them sort of, I describe them as like snowflakes in the room. They just fluttered down towards her and they were wearing white nightgowns and they were so close in age. Uh, and they were sort of, you know, holding each other so tight. They were fused together and they looked almost as one. And they, the way she described it, Kath, um, it's so lovely. She says it was like a reunion where just say you've been away from your children on a holiday and you come home and they run to you and they say, mummy, mummy, you know, this immense joy, that feeling was there. It was a reunion. She saw them again and that was all she needed to, she says, she's a very lovely, practical, down-to-earth lady and she says that that dusted me off and I picked myself up and just kept on going, you know. So that's the power of these experiences, you know. They are life-changing. Wow, they are. And even just thinking of your husband's first experience, you take Mm. somebody who's pretty grounded and something like this happens. I mean, it, it can change your life. And just by sharing it in Spirit Sisters, someone may be on the verge of taking their own life and then yes. read that and know something like that's possible. And it could that's exactly give right. people life again. Exactly. And that's, again, we come back to our message of eternal life. It gives people, the, you know, and that's also the power of storytelling. Mm-hmm. Storytelling is so powerful and sharing stories can be so life affirming and it, it's, it gives life. As you said, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I've met a far too many people in my journey the past several years that were very close to ending their lives and mm-hmm. through whether it be a story or one of the episodes of this show or a book, it, it put the people back on path and mm-hmm. to hear where they are now is amazing. And I can't help but think, Karina, with you, with me, with so many others, that we will never hear the stories of how people's lives have changed. Our job is to just keep sharing the stories. And uh, that, you know, there might be a little nudge that someone gets to read a book or listen to a podcast or whatever that may be, but it can be the thing that can give people life again. So I do believe I'm on this planet to help people believe that life after death is real. Their loved ones surround them. Our life is for a purpose. You know, I think we have education to be had and experiences to be had and things like that. But the moment we close our eyes and open them again in the unseen world, we'll be Mm. greeted with our loved ones, our pets. Speaking speaking of pets, in any of your books, did (laughs) anybody talk about animals? I don't know why. I'm, I'm sure curious. they did. I'm sure they did. Um, it's it's not as prominent as the stories about the loved people, but right. definitely, yeah. you know, and and um, there's a chapter about synchronicity in Love Never Dies, and that's a, a topic, a separate topic that I just love. Mm-hmm. I'm so intrigued by it. And, again, it just sort of supports this idea of oneness and unity that, you know, it's like a co-creation and, and a beautiful story that we're telling in our living, um, all of us together. And um, and often animals, you know, they symbolise uh, a loved one, or they they um, they remind someone of of a loved one, or they turn up at the precise moment. And yeah, they're they're very important. Our pets too. Yeah, they were they were stories. I can't think of them off the top of oh, my head, okay. but I do remember um, cats. You know, a, a, a beloved deceased cat being felt as if it was curled up on the foot of the bed and, you know, all those kinds of things. Absolutely, yeah. I've had that happen. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's nice. It really is. Uh, talk a little bit about synchronicities. I've had a few just recently, and it's just like, you know, you have somebody you? playing a trick on me. What's going on here? How is this possible? I think things I, sometimes oh. are strategically designed, and then someone has a, a good sense of humor as well. Yes, you can so sense the humor in it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, you can. Yeah. And I love that idea because it sort of speaks of, of joy that's behind the scenes as well. Um, oh, synchronicity is wonderful. I just, you know, there's, I'm just trying to think, um, there's the famous story that um, 
well, I think that is behind Carl Jung sharing or coining the term synchronicity. And he was, I don't know if you know that story, Sandra. I don't. It, no. has to do, it has to do with a client because he was a psychotherapist and it was a client that he was seeing and she was describing a story, a dream, because he, yeah, he would analyse his client's dreams and she was describing a dream that involved a scarab beetle and he, um, from memory, and I, I should fact check this before talking, but from memory, he was in an apartment which was many floors up. And um, as he was conducting the session with his client, and she's describing this this scarab beetle in the dream, and you know, and it's rich. The scarab beetle is rich with symbolism of rebirth mm-hmm. and new life. And then, in that precise moment, a, sort of a scratching at the window, and he goes, and there is a scarab beetle on his windowsill. However many um, you know floors he is up in this apartment, a, a situation that he had never encountered ever before. Or, or since, I don't think. So it was just precisely in that moment. So that's why I just love, um, you know, I often talk about mysteries and marvels and synchronicities to me sum up this idea of, of the marvellous, you know, of um, life being so much more, which you said earlier, so much more than we can even begin to imagine. Like we cannot even um, see, like we, we're just seeing, you know, to use a well-worn cliche, the tiniest tip of the iceberg. A teeny tiniest, teeny <laughs> teeny. Uh, are you familiar with Anita Morjani and her book Dying to Be Me? Yes, I read that years ago after Wayne Dyer um, endorsed it, and I loved Wayne. I still love him. I feel like he's very present now, even though he's gone. He's almost more present. Yeah, um, could be. And and I, yeah, and I uh, yes, I am familiar with Anita. She, have you you've spoken to her? Uh, I have not spoken to her. Oh. Yet. Okay. Uh, but there's a part in her book that I just remember talking about like being in a giant warehouse and it's pitch black and then it's like you get a torch or flashlight and you get to see just this tiny little bit. But meanwhile, there's this gigantic warehouse around you. And I always wow. think that our life, just like the very tip of the iceberg, like there's just this teeny tiny little bit that for us, it's everything. But if we yes. could only see the warehouse or only see the rest of the iceberg to realize, actually, I like the iceberg because you think of how supported we are, yes. how deep yes. that love is. Oh, yes. And That's my, such, it's so beautiful. Yeah, you said on another book cover when you do that. But, but just, you know, <laughs> there's so much more. And I, I just don't think our human minds are designed to really get the magnitude and maybe if we did know that that might take away some of the game of life I mean, really being mm. here to enrich our souls. That's just my speculation. But Oh, it, no, you, that's true. I, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, Sandra, it's true. It's nice to have these conversations, though, to be reminded of the rest of the iceberg and that there's so much uh, more. Yes, it's a joy. It's a joy. I, I feel enlivened speaking with you and that, you know, comes back to my, you know, experiences as a little girl and feeling enlivened when I read stories about the afterlife or heard a, a story that my mum shared or anything like that. It's this sense of, of life, you know, surging through you and possibility, possibility, you know. And when we when we fathom, when we begin to, to look at the natural world and, and space, you know, it's easy to become overwhelmed, but another approach is to just marvel and give thanks. Rumi, the, the Sufi poet, mm-hmm. has a beautiful line, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. And I love that so much. You know, That's I often great. quote that. Say that again. <laughs> sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. Love it. <laughs> love it. And there is a lot to be bewildered with. Uh, yeah, we don't have the answers even the word impossible you can change it to i'm possible like really yes. anything is possible i've been present to miracles and so things are possible i don't know how to create they them are. on demand but i do know they're possible and so let's go on to your book co-written with your sister awaken the search is over yes how yes. did that come um, about what is it oh it's so interesting because um so my, I have only one sibling, and that is my sister, who's nearly seven years younger than me, and we are so close. We live in the same suburb of Sydney, and we spend a lot of time together. We're, you know, soul sisters, best buddies, 
And um, we often, you know, share conversations not unlike the one I'm having with you today, Sandra, and we marvel and, you know, we mm-hmm. sell our cleverness together <laughs> and purchase mm-hmm. bewilderment. And um, and she, my sister, is somebody who's very uh, tuned in and she will often hear um, and sense guidance from beyond. And so this this was a, an instance of, so uh, Awaken is a manifestation of a guidance that she received in a meditation where she actually saw the little book appear. And I'll describe for your listeners what Awaken is. It's not like my previous books, which are full on kind of fat books, full of stories. Right. Awaken is a little miniature book full of quotes. Now, most of the quotes are from this meditation, this particular meditation where my sister, it was almost like a download where she saw the cover of the book. She saw that its title, Awaken the Search is Over. She understood what quotes were to be in it. And it was all so powerful that she told me immediately what had happened. And together we immediately sort of mapped out this little book and we self-published it. We went ahead and self-published it. And I didn't, you know, I wasn't privy to this meditation, but we, we decided that we'll put some of our favourite quotes in there from teachers that we've, um, like Rumi, that we've both gained so much from over the years. And so the, the little book is, um, it tells the story of how it came to be, Awaken, and it also contains some guidance that um, that Natalie, my sister, received in that meditation as well as some of our, our favourite quotes. So it's an extraordinary little little book that you know, it's kind of the little book that could. It, it, we don't really promote it. It's there. It's print on demand. And um, people read it and will will say to us, you know, I open a page and it's the right guidance that I have for that day. And it's this idea of spreading love and hope and positivity in words, which is something both of us do. Through, we're both writers. Yeah. And words are so powerful. I, oh, yeah. You know, the um, Dr. Emoto and the messages in water that whole research and all the different things that how powerful our words are, how powerful our thoughts are. Oh, yes. Gosh, uh, I should have (laughs) a picture of, (laughs) did did you know his rice experiment that he did? Yes. Yes, yes, I'm familiar with that. And yes, it's it's incredible stuff. And people have done this with a banana too. And for our listener who may not know what I'm talking about, uh, Dr. Moto tested water and he would have... For instance, people all over Japan would boil a pot of rice and he would say, divide it into two glass jars. In one glass jar, put in one room, the other one in another room. Go into the one room, love the rice, positive words, positive thoughts, et cetera, and so forth. In the other room, negative words, negative thoughts, et cetera. Mm. At the end of a month, the rice that was said good words to would be like a nutty aroma kind of a yellowish color golden color and the other one was black and then Hmm. people i know have experimented with bananas from the same bunch one in one room one in the other one Mm -hmm. ripens really quickly and you can guess which one that is and the other one stays fresher longer so to think that we are made up of water you know there's a whole bunch of uh thoughts about you know our thoughts becoming real things and to Gosh, if we could live life with somehow being present to how much our thoughts and our words matter, I think. Oh my goodness! We you know, be so hard on ourselves. Mm. Oh yeah, and and it all all of that to me speaks of the oneness of life and of creation. We we are one, you know, with the earth and with our fellow humans. And to me, it's as you know, simple as if you see a field of flowers and all those flowers arise. Well, humans arise in the same way. And we're, we're just a part of this, you know, beautiful force of life that is constantly creating. And our minds are constantly creating, you know, whether we like it or not or whether we are conscious of it or not. So as, as that experiment and those experiments of the doctors show, um, when we focus, when we focus on positivity and, and love and joy, we um we will get we will see something beautiful and miraculous and i think um sandra if i'm not mistaken he's also done experiments where not even um you know sending negative thoughts to the to the other um pot of rice or whatever but just neglecting it just yes. ignoring it has an effect as well yeah we used you know. to hear things about people who um talk to their plants i think it's all along the same it is wavelength 
whether they're it ignored, is. whether they're talked to. But I love the idea of your Awaken book because sometimes it's just a few words that can make your day. Yes. Or break your day. Yes. But why not put in something that's going to make your day? That's that's exactly right. And I think that's why my sister and I, we try to follow the guidance when we get it. And she got it and she felt like it was very urgent to to get that little book published. And that was in uh, 2016. So it's some years ago now. And we, even though it's there and we're not actually focusing our attention on publicizing it, we know that it plays a part in the bigger puzzle and it will come to fruition. My sister and I at the moment are... Um, collaborating on a a beautiful charity which again has arisen from some guidance that she received regarding the ripple effect and so our charity is called ripples of love and it's to do with providing care packages for people in need and we know that awaken will play a part in these care packages in the future we're in the in the process now of growing the charity and we know that at some point we will have um, financial support to print hundreds if not thousands of copies of Awake and and make sure that one goes in each of the care baskets. So it's just this idea of following the guidance step by step, you see. Oh, that's um, nice. Yeah. Yeah, so we know that even though, you know, Awaken at the moment is not get receiving all our attention, we know that it's it's there and it will play its part soon enough again. (laughs) Well, you may have a new reader after this recording (laughs) or or many so I wanted I do want to ask you about your podcast because that's the next upcoming thing for you but if people are interested in your books your website karinamachado.com and also your have them on Amazon correct Yes, that's correct. And um, they're also available as audiobooks. I had a wonderful, oh. I spent a wonderful few weeks in Melbourne recording mm-hmm. them as audiobooks a few years ago. And I, I really enjoyed that process. So they're on Audible. Um, so I would love listeners to to have a listen and they should be available on Kindle. If they're not, please let me know. They're certainly available on Kindle in Australia. Um, so yes, and Spirit Sisters, the print copy is out of print at this point, and I, I would love for it to be in print again at some stage. But uh, you can certainly find secondhand copies on eBay, I believe, and uh, Book Depository in the UK is a wonderful resource for books because it doesn't charge uh, any shipping fees and it sends all around the world. So, so I hope that um, readers can find my books on any in any of those um, ways and let me know what they think. Yes, definitely and truly, I'm an audiobook person myself. And I'm also a Kindle person. Not that I have ah. a Kindle, but you can, I can read a Kindle on my phone, on my yes. computer. So there's a way to get the information. So yes. let's talk about the podcast. What's going yes. on? What's it called? When okay. are you launching? Why are you doing okay. it? <laughs> right. I'm so excited about this. So it is called Spirit Sisters, the podcast, and the idea is to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the publishing of Spirit Sisters, the publication of Spirit Sisters in 2009. It's bang on 10 years now, and it was such a, um, it was such a momentous book in so many ways. I, it really, I feel like even its title, it was m- the most successful of my books Um, commercially that's for sure and I feel like it's titled Spirit Sisters had so much to do with it and we talked earlier about you know taking the step-by-step path and and um, and the guidance and I feel like the success of Spirit Sisters in a way was pointing me to this idea of the sisterhood and how important that's going to be in the future with the ripple effect and all my projects um, with my sister at the moment so that's interesting but this idea for the podcast was to celebrate the book and its publication. So two things. One, I will revisit some of my most unforgettable stories from Spirit Sisters as well as my subsequent books. So I've got I've done interviews with um some some of my some of my most oh amazing interviewees and and I just cannot wait to share these conversations. And also, I'm inviting people to share new stories with me. So I want to uncover new stories, fresh stories of contact with the spirit world, apparitions, premonitions. I've interviewed people who've seen their doppelgangers. Um, Near-death experiences is a, a major fascination of mine at the moment. It has been for a few years. I'm intrigued by them. No doubt I will write a book about either one incredible near-death experience in the future or collate stories. Um, 
So that, that, Sandra, will be the podcast. I have launched the introductory episode, which is just a little 11-minute um, explanation of Spirit Sisters and its place in my life and in the life of my readers. And all going well, uh, by the weekend I will have the very first full episode up, which is a catch-up with an interviewee from Spirit Sisters called Amy, and she shares a story that I have never forgotten. And when people ask me about a story from my three books, it's always the one that comes to mind. It's called The Family, and Amy will be sharing it with me um, on the Spirit Sisters podcast, episode one. <laughs> well, that's a good reason for us to listen, isn't it? Because you're just like, I want to <laughs> yeah. know, I want to know. Oh, it's got to do with, um, yes, I'll give you a little hint. Okay. Um, something that she saw in a childhood sleepover. So I interviewed her when she was a, in her early 20s, 10 years ago, and um, the experience happened at a sleepover when she was about eight years old at her friend's house, and she saw something incredible. And I cannot wait to, the story is in Spirit Sisters and I just love it. And I can't wait to, to share the conversation with Amy. And 10 years on, the story is still, still plays a big part in her life, the memory of what she saw that night. Oh, that makes me want to ask you the following question, because this ties in with near-death experiences. People that I've interviewed, and there's been a bunch that have had near-death experiences, mm. remember the NDE better than any memory they've ever had. I mean, mm -hmm. like it just happened so clear, so vivid. The people um, that have had some of the visitations with the apparitions and things, have you heard stories like this, Amy, that are so fresh in their minds, like it's it, it couldn't have been something that their mind created? Absolutely. And as I mentioned to you earlier, the story of the, that the bereaved mum, mm -hmm. Kath, who saw the spirit of her girls. When I, Kath is somebody who I re-interviewed for the for Spirit Sisters, the podcast, and I'll be sharing that in in the weeks to come. I could not believe um, speaking to her, and it had been a good eleven years since I'd last spoken to her about this story. How fresh and present the experience was, and she shared it. It was almost like. The, that initial conversation with her, like it was word for word, so powerful. And I, like you, Sandra, I've marveled at that, you know, and that's the power of these experiences and the NDE, you know, for people that say, oh, it's a trick of the mind or it's the oxygen or whatever, you know, excuses they give. But how can that be when it, it's su it leaves such an imprint on their lives and they're never the same person, you know? Oh, yes. And, you know, I used to be one of those skeptics that would say, it's just their mind shutting down. Mm. Having no idea when you do your investigations, Ken Ring is someone who followed in uh, Dr. Raymond Moody's footsteps, and he would research the near-death experiences of blind people that never oh, yeah. had sight. And there are so many stories of what they saw. <laughs> that really happened. <laughs> and when, when we transition... Uh, we take our last, like I said, breath here on earth. I do believe we are restored fully in health. We get to be our perfect um, age that we love the best, yep. the perfect weight. Yep. If we had glasses, we don't. If we had crooked teeth, we don't, whatever that may be. And so it just takes our passion, kind of like what you're doing, what I'm doing. And I always mm. encourage the listeners, if there's something here that it, it, it just kind of lights a flame like, ooh, I might be interested oh, in that. Yes. Follow it. Pursue it. Please be, do be it. Be bewildered by it. Be passionate. Because it, it, this has given me my life. And it sounds like from your passion, it's given you your life as well. It has. It has. And it's so interesting that you say that about the passions because I mentioned the charity Ripples of Love that my sister and I have launched. And this was part of the guidance Natalie received when she understood that she was to form this charity and the care packages. One element that is key to the care package in her understanding um, was that it should include something to remind the person, the recipient of their passion. You know, when you're dealing with, obviously, life-threatening situations, mm -hmm. we've helped hundreds of people amazingly, humbly, since we launched this uh, Ripples of Love a year ago, 
and obviously some of the situations are heartbreaking, you know, women fleeing domestic violence and situations where life has literally been on hold because such a challenging situation, like you're in fight or flight for so long. And when when things like that happen, obviously your childhood passion for either drawing or for horses or for whatever it may be, writing, takes a side step, you know, it's it, it's sidelined. And Natalie's um, idea for the, the ripples of love boxes, we call them big love boxes, nice. were for them to include, to include a link. So we always ask the caseworker or the, the shelter manager, you know, is it possible to, to, to ascertain what is this lady's um, passion? And in there, just say we're told it is drawing. Well, we will include in the care package sketchbook and, and colours, you know, because, as you say, like following that thing that lights you up puts you on the road to healing. That's really beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're very excited about the, the direction this is going in. Thank you, Sandra, for giving me the chance to share about that. Well, and now I'm thinking it's almost time to end the episode. But yes. what can we create and get our listener involved to that's either a ripple of love or a pay it forward or being in touch with our own passion? You know what I'm mm. getting at? I always like to leave a little nugget of, oh, yeah. I don't want to call it a take away. I can call it soul, <laughs> soul work. don't want it to be work, but just something yeah. that can awaken our soul. Any ideas? Oh, well, I, I believe that even a thought, a kind thought, like even, even if you just, for instance, just say there's a coworker or a family member who you've had problems with and, and they're challenging and we've all got that, we've all had that. Even in your thoughts, and this, you know, comes back to the idea of prayer and why prayer is powerful, but change your thoughts towards them. Send them a blessing. You know, there's a beautiful um, tradition in the Celtic, in the Celtic tradition to bless. And I love the idea of blessing, you know, because it's something that doesn't cost any money, doesn't take any time, and we can just bless in our hearts. We don't even have to use our voices, although it potentially could be more powerful if we speak it, but even in our hearts, just the thought is enough to to change the energy and potentially shift your relationship, you know? Okay, I'll take that one on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not an angel. I'm a human being. But yeah, we all have it. I, th I think you're absolutely correct. And it, it it's a challenge. Ha and how really, how much work is it to spend a couple of minutes to find gr what things we're grateful for or to oh. bless somebody? It, and why are we so autopilot on to look for negative and think negative? But, and we are. I mean, Aren't thoughts. We? I mean, studies have been done to show that the brain is more susceptible and more focused on a negative thought than a positive one. So we are wired this way. So it's about being countercultural and being counterintuitive almost in a way in terms of what society teaches us, you know, about it's obviously it's important to have self-esteem and stand up for ourselves, you right. know, to honour ourselves. But it's also this idea of doing the countercultural thing and, you know, blessing somebody who's, who's hurt you. And it's not easy. It's not easy. Believe me, I know very well. But as we all do, and as you do, Sandra, um, we've all experienced that. But I think that if we if we could each do that, you know, we could we could um, create a tipping point. We could shift the energy, you know, and help help put ourselves on a collective path to healing. Mm -hmm. There was a book there was called, a book called "The Magic" by Rhonda Byrne, who did the oh, secret. Yes. And I've mean, interviewed Rhonda. She's Australian. Yeah, she, yeah, she's great. But I remember doing this 28 day practice and there were some blessings, positive words, gratitude, but a lot of it in 28 days. I mean, a lot yep. of it, yep. but the talk about synchronicities that showed up in my life mm. were absolutely incredible. And I thought, and then I told some other people about it and they were doing the 28 days and they were telling me all these miracles that happened. And it's interesting that you say that. Uh, however words you said it that that like we're more drawn or it's autopilot mm. the negative mm. thoughts so it's almost like yeah. hey wait a minute it's not my fault that's just part of being human but we can acknowledge that's right. it and choose something else exactly so that's because why that echo chamber yeah yeah that's why i haven't done the 28 days over and over and over even though it was producing such great things 
So it's just okay. So now I'm having just a little compassion here that, um, yeah, yeah, that's just how our minds work. Hmm. That's right, Sandra. And the thing is, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the iceberg before, and I think that's very much representative of people's lives as well. You know, we don't know everything that's going on in no. someone's life, you know, and we don't know everything that's gone into that the creation of that person and all of the background pain and suffering. We, we actually don't know. We don't. So compassion. What a beautiful idea. Like just even amidst our pain and our hurt, and, and that's very human and we, we should accept that and acknowledge it, but not, not dwell there. We right. release it and then we, we make room for better things, you know, to come in and to come out of us. <laughs> Excellent. So what I'm taking from this, and so this totally made my day, is I'm thinking Yay. of the iceberg. I'm thinking about <laughs> the tip of the iceberg and then we really have no idea about the unseen world and yes. the support we have, but also the compassion for our fellow human beings yes. that we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg and we've not lived in their shoes. So have compassion and say a blessing, send them a blessing. Yes. Send them a blessing, you know, send them a blessing and nobody's saying it's easy, but just make yourself do it, <laughs> you know, and if we continue to make ourselves do it, it will become easier. It can become a habit which is, is a beautiful thing. Yes, the ideal. Yeah. Wow. Karina, thank you for being our guest today. Oh, thank you so much, Sandra. I've so enjoyed our chat. I feel like I could just sit here and chat to you for hours. <laughs> I know. I just want to pour you a cup of tea and we'll just Yay. relax. Oh, That yes. would be so nice. It'll well, happen. if you're ever in Sydney, if you're ever in Sydney, please look me up. And if I'm ever in Boston, I'm going to look you up. <laughs> Absolutely. And I do plan on going global with our We Don't Die Enterprises. And, uh, great. And, yeah, Ooh, maybe we could something. collaborate. Sure we can. I think that's great. <laughs> and for our listener, you can find Karina at KarinaMachado.com. Her books yes. are all on Amazon. Uh, you may be with me as I drive coming up in the not too distant future because I love audio books. Yeah, your books How are lovely. Spirit Sisters, Where Spirits Dwell, Love Never Dies, and the little pocketbook Awaken. The search yes, is over. The search is over. And the little podcast introductory episode is out now. You can what find it, it on iTunes and Spotify. And then full episodes coming very soon, conversations with my my most unforgettable interviewees, as well as fresh uh, fresh stories. So if you've got a story to share as well, please get in touch through my Facebook page or my website. Okay, that sounds great. And for our listener, if you are listening on uh, YouTube right now, I will have the link, or I do have the link by the time you listen to Karina's podcast. So you can easily click on that and go right to it and also your Facebook page and your website. That's so wonderful, Sandra. I can't thank you enough. It's been just beautiful speaking with you today. You too. And it's so easy for me to share. I think that's one of the things that I like doing best. Oh. I like new friends and I like to share and I like to play. So this was all of the above. <laughs> Yay. That's yeah. so great. Thank you. You're welcome. And for our listener, thank you for being with Karina Machado and I. This is episode 305. Yes, wow. you heard it right, 305. <laughs> and for those people who, um, I got a couple emails, Karina, because it's I've been working my day job, my catering business, so I haven't oh, yeah. aired too many episodes in the, in the recent past. Uh, so I apologize. Uh, yeah. And people <laughs> always, this is something I do, you can go back to one of the earlier episodes. And you're a different person now than you were three years ago when you listen to episode whatever it may be so you can mm -hmm. always find gold I think in any conversation and there's plenty of good books and podcasts and things out there but our home base for this show is we don't die radio.com and on that website you can find all 305 episodes and play them um, there's also you can belong to my email list which I call the insiders club and I give you a free healing audio called how to survive grief and some other good things there. Also, if you are on Facebook, we have a great Facebook community. You just type in We Don't Die Listeners. It's a private Facebook group with over 4,000 members now, but you can really share all things afterlife, afterlife, grief related, help with, you know, to have a powerful life because I do believe we are souls having a human experience and life can be tough sometimes, you know, but so you're there amongst friends, whereas I think in our lives, so many of us 
don't share this part of ourselves with the people closest to us because we might get a strange look, you know, that we believe in this afterlife thing. So in We Don't Die listeners, our Facebook group, you can just be yourself. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I'm always so happy to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So think about what you're passionate about, maybe a childhood dream or drawing or whatever that may be. Look for opportunities to pay it forward, um, to share ripples of love, be compassionate, and take a minute, bless yourself, bless others, and let's just play with this. I really do think, as Karina says, it really could change the direction of our life. So I really want to thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.